Okay, so let's get to why we're here tonight. And we're going to talk about what was the initial question? Can we dive our intended algorithm on any one dive, and even more specifically, can we repeat it? Are we falling in some range of consistency? So let's compare what a mathematical model takes into account, and then let's compare it to an actual dive and what may actually be going on. And then you can decide for yourself what that means to you. And of course, you better agree with me. <laughs> so, okay. so um, this representation is of a somewhat of a dive, and forgive my writing, but there's four phases that we break a dive up into. The first one is our descent, and part two is our bottom time, part three is a piece of our ascent, and part four is where most of our stops take place. Now, we know an algorithm just pretty much manages our ascent. But you know, there's a little bit more going on than just that. So let's talk about part one. You have loading going on. Your, your computer, your forecaster is saying, during this descent, you're descending at a particular speed. Anyone know what that speed is? Most of the time, for a mathematical model, they usually use 60 feet per minute. You can manipulate some of your forecasters, but typically that's what they do. Your real-time computer will take in your loading as your diving takes place, okay? But what that computer is not taking into account in your loading is the inner gas that's loading due to fitness, temperature, and conditions like current. Anybody ever work a little harder when they jump in the water and trying to go down the line? Yeah, sometimes it's just easy. You just fall and hit the wreck. Doesn't happen. <laughs> so your de descent speed is affected. And depending on how consistent that is, it matters. And also, if you're diving a CCR and you're forecasting for a CCR, and you're using a constant set point computer versus a real time computer, it won't take into account your gas mixture change. On rebreathers, they change all the time. Right. Is that what dangerous? Anyway. So, <laughs> so, part two is not much different. Loading is going to take place, but again, the model only takes into account a specific average. It doesn't take into account workload. It doesn't care about workload. It doesn't care about your fitness levels. It doesn't care about your temperature, your perfusion rates, which change in various ranges throughout the dive. It just says it's all one damn thing. And when you get to this point, it's a very standardized value. At the deepest, furthest part of the dive, you have accumulated this much gas, period. That's a theoretical model. From there, your theoretical model then would dictate that you're making a perfect ascent at 30 feet per minute, that your loading, again, is still consistent, the same among all of you in this room. The dive would be the same no matter what. The currents would be the same no matter what. Temperature would be the same no matter what. Your rebreather would all have the same mixtures. Or maybe you're just on open circuit. You do have the same mixtures. Part four, there's no stop pattern. You're not doing 10-foot stop patterns. A real algorithm is taking into account a, a specific range that takes place across the board, not 10-foot patterns. I do 10-foot patterns because they're logical, they're easy, they something that ingrained into us, and it works. But 
It also says you're doing a perfect descent throughout that whole time. You're having the perfect gas mixture in your fitness level, temperature, everything. It's a perfect world, right? That's what a model is. Now, we, we always hear everyone saying, oh, it's a theoretical model. It's a theoretical model, um, OK? So let's talk about the actual execution. In phase one, what's different? Everything's different. But you know, if you've got a real time computer and everything's different, the real time computer is keeping track of it, so it's all cool, right? No, it's not. So, descent speed is different. And it's not just on an average, it varies. Your gas mixture. If you're on a rebreather, absolutely varies, and so does your loading. This one especially, where your workload happens, your temperature varies, and your ability to process your fitness level all manages. The outcome that's actually in your body is not what the algorithm says it should be. Are you diving your model? Can you catch up to your model once you leave it? No, you're already off. You barely started your dive and you're off your model. But you know, I got a lot of pieces of paper that you guys all filled out and everybody thought you came darn close. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make this worse, okay? Part two, pretty much the same thing is over here. The computer says it's exactly the same thing all the time, but it can't be. Just like it couldn't be on your descent. I'm lazy. I'm going to put same thing here. <laughs> so. Remember where this was a standardized value? It brings you to a point just before your ascent, and it says, OK, if you go up now and you swim 30 feet per minute and you hold all your stops and you have a perfect gas mixture and you don't work too hard, but you don't work too little, and you do it just right, you're going to stay right on this algorithm. Point is, you were never here to begin with. Never mind, you could do the rest of that stuff on top of it, OK? So this is an inconsistent value. You're off. Part three, this is where, really, this is where everyone thinks it happens. And it happens more. So, A lot of people in here are diamond shear orders. How do you know when you're summing your ascent speeds? How do you, how do you measure them? Three bars. Three bars. OK, you get that little yeah. graph. It's almost like the battery light, but it's right next to it. It just pops up as you're ascending. And for each bar, that's 10 feet per minute in ascent time, right? Um, BAP was kind enough to fill me in because I forget. Yellow is 30 feet per minute. 30 to 59, I think. And as soon as you hit 60 feet per minute, which is where you explode, no, um, it turns red. Is it 30 to 40 is yellow? Uh, it's, it's 10 to 20 is white, and then 30 to 40 is uh, yellow, and then 50 to 60 is red. OK. okay. They're going to change it again. This is why I don't know anymore. They change it all the time. So, but anyway, you want to keep, keep out of the red and keep out of the white. And if you stay in yellow, you're doing pretty good. But you know what? Yellow, 30 feet per minute, 
occurrence, workload, a line that's like this, not like this, gas bubbles, working hard, which we're all against. Your ascent speed is crucial. This point up to your first stop, you have to not just average 30 feet per minute, you actually have to do 30 feet per minute the entire time to stay on your model, which, by the way, you're already off anyway. Your gas mask on your rebreather. And by the way, just because your computer's registering, even in real time, you know how long it takes for your cells to actually tell you what your oxygen level is, which is then what your nitrogen and helium values are, and measure those. Not that good. You're loading. Now, according to the computer, it's perfect. We're all the same fitness level. We all work just as hard. There's no currents. It's always a beautiful day. Temperature remains the same from the bottom to the first stop. It's consistent. Your perfusion is the same. It's a perfect world. Huh. Let's see. You're off your plan. You're off your plan. No way. Oh, I'll catch up. Can't do it. Why can't you catch up? On gassing, it's a compounding value. You can't catch up to it once you lose it. Okay. Then we go to phase four. Over here, there were no stop patterns. It was that nice dotted line. Nah, we're doing 10 foot stop patterns. If we're good. Even then, they tend to be kind of, let's be honest, they're all over the place, right? Our ascent speed between those stops throughout the whole process is inconsistent. Our gas mixtures, doing a lot of oxygen flushes, I hope, are loading. Are we working during deco? If you are, you really need to consider buying a Seacraft scooter. We've got them here. You can leave tonight, okay? Because this is bad. This is very bad. I'm just here to help. <laughs> there we go. Take his picture. He was, ar he was already, uh, you were already whoring yourself out on the boat for one. So here it is. We always hear those words. We hear it. I hear people say it all the time, and they really don't add value to it. Oh, it's just a theoretical model. We don't actually die with Oh, they're just theoretical tissues. We don't. Shit. This is theoretical algorithm that you cannot hear once. And you think you actually replicate it? over and over and over again consistently? Even if you're just off the same way, could you ever possibly be off the same way because you have a pattern or a method or you're lazy in a particular way, whatever, however you want to put it, could you do it? You can't. Huge difference, not a little, huge difference between theoretical and actual execution. So where does that leave us? Well, it, it leaves us with some interesting thoughts. In order to dive your model, you must execute it perfectly. We know that. So there's clearly a difference between an algorithm and a diver's execution. Does anyone disagree? My wife is on. Does anyone disagree? <laughs> No, it's okay. I mean, really, do you, do you disagree? It's okay. Just a matter of opinion. Okay. 
We do know, and we all agreed before, when you miss the model, you can't catch up. That's not just a theory, it's a fact. You miss it. Even if you didn't miss the model, could you be on in the first place? Nah. So what are the variables? Bilateral gas exchange, compounding value of deco stress across tissue compartments, inconsistent ascent speeds, workloads and fitness effects, stop patterns, non-vertical ascents coupled with current surges, fitness levels, temps, gas mixtures. It's a mess. It's more accurate to say that people define a model as a maximum value but never reach these values. Is this being conservative? Who knows? Who cares? The statement that the algorithms are just mathematical models that have nothing to do with what is going on in our bodies should hold new meaning for you, I hope. I hope you sat through all of this tonight for some reason. And uh, most importantly, I think everyone was under the impression, I know I was for a long time, that even if we weren't really diving our model, that we were kind of close. And because we have general habits, our habits tended to lend to something that, regardless of what the number was we put in our computer, we probably were coming close to about the same thing. And the end result was, not going to a chamber, must be pretty good, right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with that logic. In fact, I agree with it a lot, a lot more than you think. Um, so what's the likelihood of DCS again? If that. So I want you to stop and think about something. Think of every diver you have ever been next to, you've been out with. Do you think on all of those dives, including yourself and all of those people that you were with, they ever dove the same thing twice? Not possible. So if the incident rate is what it is, and people are picking various algorithms, picking various conservatisms to apply to those algorithms. Clearly, it doesn't matter much. And there's no one who can argue with that because there's way too much empirical data to prove it. There's a wide range of safe. Remember that diver? Remember when TAC went to 300 feet for an hour and then blew his head off, right? And then we talked about the rest of the unearned hits. Are they connected? It would have been great if they were, but we've pretty much established that they're not. But is controlling, is selecting an algorithm, choosing to dive a particular algorithm, keeping you safer, reducing your incident rate, keeping some sense of control over it, does it matter? It doesn't seem to matter because everyone is diving nothing of what they think they're diving. There's all different initials to use with numbers that they assign to those on top of it. And shit, we're all over the place. And we're all doing pretty good. So I spent more than a reasonable amount of time thinking about decompression over the years. And what it's led me to, this point. Pick a number, go diving, and shut the fuck up. Pointing fingers, telling people that they're unsafe, dictating what other people ought to be diving, telling people that they're going too fast, too slow, that they're I've got something figured out that you don't, when nobody can even do it, is pretty stupid. The person that says that really hasn't thought things through, isn't really educated, doesn't really know what they're talking about. And it's not that their opinion is wrong. They're facts. 
are inconsistent. Pick a number, go diving, and think about the stuff that really ought to concern you. Decompression is not one of them. Because if you think selecting a particular algorithm is going to increase your safety, I think you're fooling yourself. But we're all pretty adamant about it, right? I think you can relax, enjoy yourself, go diving, and worry about tripping on the back of the boat and breaking your, your leg. <laughs> um, there's lots of things that go wrong diving that we should be more concerned about. This isn't one of them. And certainly, using an algorithm to control and manage the safety of it is way off the mark, unless you go way off the reservation, like TAC. Whoa. Not TAC. It's just a, just a bad example. So that's the point of this lecture. I hope it helps you in some way. If you have any questions, She's really, she's really not armed right now. <laughs> yes? Um, so circling back, you mentioned some of the reserve kits. Do you want to uh, extrapolate a little bit on that at all? Do you feel that there's such thing as an unreserved kit? Um, not in relation to an algorithm. Uh, do, do I think there's an anomaly that we haven't accounted for yet um, that we then have to identify it as unearned? Yeah, I just don't think we've identified it yet. But I think they're pretty darn close. They're getting, getting very close. And uh, it's not what we were all raised to believe. So... Yes. Based on what you said, that you would be all over the board on that number as well. What's your what's your thought on some of the establishing operations factor that in theory makes me feel good about this? It's that's a great it's a great question. And actually that logic has been built into a lot of decompression education whether it's passed along in written form or implied, most instructors in most educational systems do imply that you can tell the value of your model by how you feel. We've all read that, heard it, right? Yeah, and, and the greatest example that we can, I want to compare it to is exactly what she just said. Nitrox, oh, if you breathe nitrox, you're going to feel better because there's a higher oxygen content. And they're still selling that. They're still selling that, right? Go on a 30-foot dive and buy nitrox, right? <laughs> wow. So, and we have studies that show that there's some Yeah, physiologically, you can't absorb any more oxygen anyway. It's not going to change the difference in how you feel. This, here's where that idea comes from. Oh, and this is so common in the dive industry. There's a reason that something happens and it gets painted across the board onto everything. It's not unusual for people that experience a decompression hit to feel excessively tired prior to that hit. Okay, they come up out of the water, they're not feeling good, they're feeling excessively tired, and then before you know it, they end up in a chamber. Okay, so that then leads, in, that's like tack at 300 feet, you know, in the unearned hit. We try to create a correlation across the board on everything. 
How many days, most of you in this room, most of you anyway, are getting old enough that, man, there's just some days I drive to work and I get tired, right? In fact, my wife and I have a joke. Every time we feel tired for some reason, I must be getting bent, right? <laughs> we do. We say this to each other all the time. Must be getting bent. I better sit down on the couch, right? That's my biggest excuse. I can put my ass on the couch for any reason because I feel like I'm bent. But the... Uh, the reality is that there's all kinds of reasons that we feel tired. And, you know, going out on a boat and diving all day uh, can certainly make you fresh air and sunshine and hard work will definitely make you feel tired. But if you think that it, there's a correlation to your dive profile and how you feel, that's a placebo. Okay? We're just not that sensitive. Bap is. He's kind of he's a sensitive guy, but uh, yeah, but uh, yeah. <laughs> so, but seriously, and that's it's really a, a a miscommunication about an actual uh, concern or uh, something that does come about and lead to DCS, and now it gets blamed on everything. If I dive this profile, I feel better than another profile. That's not possible. Okay. It, it is a placebo, and there's a lot of other factors that go into how we feel. So it has, one has nothing to do with the other. But that's where it comes from. That's the root of it. So. Wow. Everybody wants to go home. <laughs> Any other questions? OK. How many Seacraft scooters do we need? <laughs> Come on. All right. Okay. Well, before you go. <laughs> yeah, always. Um, So for those of you who are aware of our nonprofit, TRERO, uh, in fact, a new website's under construction. We'll be ready in about three weeks. But uh, most people aren't aware of this website and what's there. But there's over 400 research papers that have been vetted categorized and put together and it's I admit on the old site it was a little harder to search through this information but one of the one of the things that's going to change is how easy it will be to pull up information from whether it's through date or subject matter or uh, who the author is or whatever it will be very easy to search and there's there's literally no place which is a really sad statement but there's no place in the dive industry that the average person could go and find information like this, especially collectively. Okay? It's all there for you to learn about various things from decompression and oxygen values and fitness and exercise, diet, and, and all the things that are concerning to you as a diver. And one of the things that I really challenge people on is in the dive industry, everybody says they're learning all the time. I don't agree. I don't agree at all. I, I thoroughly disagree. Just because you go diving and you gain more experience doesn't mean you're learning. It actually takes cracking a book. It actually takes learning outside the industry about psychology and physics and physiology and this, just because it doesn't say scuba on it doesn't mean it does, it's not related to diving. And if you really want to break outside the confines of the educational system that's been crafted for you, you need to find better information. And this is the information age. It is available. We made it really easy on TRERO. Um, Claudia's put together an amazing library that's growing all the time. Uh, can I ask you if, if these presentations were available online?
on a regular basis, would that interest you? Even even with tech, yeah. All right, good. That's that helps. So okay. Well, I like that. We, yeah. Well, I think we're gonna. You know, we've we've been, we've we have an amazing webinar system that we put in that's two way interactive, and we're gonna be able to field questions from dozens of people at the same time, and actually have people from all over the place. And we we hope to do more lectures if people are really interested. I question in the doc people really want new information. Most people seem to be very happy with the way things are, and they're not really truly interested in changing their thought process. Contrary to the saying that divers are always learning. I, 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 I'll challenge anyone on that. Different? And if you want to help it, help us. Talk about this presentation. <laughs> if you did like it, please talk about it. Please let people know that these things are going to take place. And if enough people respond and say, yes, we want this, we'll do it. We have tons and tons of lectures and information that Nobody else has in the dive industry that we are thrilled to put out there if people want to listen, but we're not going to do it if people aren't. We have some questions about the suggestions that people could make suggestions. I would love that. And you know, if we don't know, we love learning. We'll research it. Right? But there's there's typic there's really no end to what we can do, but um, a lot of people, every employee here at Ad Helium probably doesn't like me as much this week because we really worked hard to get this together. Uh, Sean killed himself, Dianara, Emily, Robin, everybody. Jose, who's not even here tonight, Michael, everybody worked really hard to make this available for you tonight. So I'd like to say thank you to them for putting up with me because I was kind of relentless about it. And, uh, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope it was worth it. Thanks for your time. <laughs>